Great. Hi, welcome everyone, and thank you for being here today. I have a few slides about the CSA and some housekeeping notes, and then I'll turn it over to Leah Shanley to introduce our series and our panelists. The CSA is a member, oh, sorry. The CSA is a member-driven organization that connects people from a wide range of experiences around a common purpose of advancing knowledge through research and monitoring done by, for, and with members of the public. Our efforts are concentrated into a biennial conference. Our next one will be in May of 2021. We have a peer-reviewed journal um, and member services such as our working groups, online networking, and webinars like these. Our membership represents the multidisciplinary and multidimensional nature of the field and includes project leaders, researchers, educators, and more. Um, the Law and Policy Working Group that coordinated this webinar series is one of nine working groups that explore cross-cutting issues like ethics, environmental justice, evaluation, and more. Our working groups are one of the key ways that we work to advance the goals of the CSA through the sharing of resources, best practices, and relevant information, both among group members and also to the broader citizen science community. You can find out more about how to get involved with the Law and Policy Working Group and attend upcoming meetings on their website. Um, I think Leah will share a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the Law and Policy Working Group has coordinated nine great webinars over the last several months. You can find these archived on our YouTube channel and also on the webinar page of our website. Um, we have several webinars coming up, including two more in a series of events on using citizen science in higher education, um, one on Friday, June 5th on assessment and another on, um, this is actually on June 12th, on using citizen science in non-STEM courses. And we also have a town hall coming up next week on volunteer field work um, during COVID-19 that we hope any of you that are postponing or looking to get back out in the field will attend. Um, there are a few ways that you can help support these, this free webinar series. One is by becoming a member of the CSA. Becoming a member, um, is, there's lots of great perks to it. Um, and one of the things that our members say is most important is networking. It's a great way to make connections across the field and support our working groups um, and the quality work that they help to produce. Um, you can find out information on how to join on our website. We also have a donation page that I'll link to in the chat. Um, and if you've learned something and have the means, you can help keep, the, keep these webinars free for those who can't afford to pay. Lastly, we are expecting a large crowd on the call today and everyone is in listen only mode. We do want to get to know more about you though and answer any questions you may have. If you would, please head over to the chat and you can introduce yourself, tell us where you're from. We'll be taking questions in the Q&A box. Um, it's a little easier for us for that to coordinate those there. And so if you have a question, um, the Q&A box is along this bottom bar and you can post those there. You can also upvote questions that you like. Um, it's a really great tool. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Leah Shanley to introduce our panelist. Uh, Leah Shanley is a senior fellow at the Nelson Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, she's a co-chair of our Law and Policy Working Group and has been spearheading this series with the Law and Policy Group uh, of these great webinars. And big thanks to Leah to putting all these pieces together. Good morning and or good afternoon as the case may be. And thank you, Rihanna. I also wanna thank Rihanna for all her hard work and a close collaboration and helping our law and policy working group to put, a get, to put together nine <laughs> webinars over the last nine months or 10 months, I can't believe it. Um, so we're, this is the last in our series uh, for this semester um, and uh, we'll see what may come in the fall, but we're very, very delighted today to have you here uh, to focus on citizen science, community engagement and the sustainable development goals for the United Nations. Um, our speakers today will discuss how citizen science may be integrated uh, into the formal United Nations Sustainable Development Goals reporting mechanisms and provide the results of a systematic review uh, of the SDG indicators and how citizen science initiatives uh, may address them. Successful use of citizen science data and ongoing efforts by the national statistics offices, UN agencies, and cities uh, will be highlighted here today. So with that, I'd like to hand it off to our very first speaker, Dr. Linda C. She's a senior research fellow in the Center for Earth Observation and Citizen Science at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. You may know it as EASA. She's part of the GeoWiki team developing tools for citizen science and crowdsourcing 
to collect data on land cover and land use through visual interpretation of high resolution satellite imagery. And with that, I'll hand it over to, to uh, Linda. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Leah. As uh, she mentioned, my name is Linda C. I work for the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, which is a research institute just outside of Vienna in Austria. And I'm going to kick off with uh, an, a, an overview of citizen science and the sustainable development goals. I wrote Linda C. and many, many others because this presentation is based on, on a paper that we uh, published last October, Nature Sustainability. Um, and this was based on a workshop that we held a year before where we invited uh, representatives from different citizen science associations around the world, practitioners in citizen science, researchers who are interested in citizen science in the SDGs, UN agencies, national statistical offices, et cetera. Um, and so this talk is really a summary of this paper. This paper is available open access on the Nature Sustainability website, so you can search for it, but I know that Rihanna will also be providing links. Okay, so I'll, I'll start off with just an overview of the UN SDG framework. Uh, I think most people know um, what the SDGs are, but basically they were ratified in September 2015 by the United Nations. Um, it's a framework that governments can use to implement policies to basically make improvements in a lot of different areas. And that's these 17 goals, whether it's poverty, education, health and well-being, gender, all, all sorts of different things, and uh, the environment. So, so, so there are these 17 goals, which then are broken down into 169 targets, and then further broken down into 232 quantitative indicators, which can be used for monitoring pr progress. These indicators are also divided into tiers. So we have tier one, two, and three. Tier one means that the indicator has an established international methodology and data. Tier two means um, the methodology is there, but the data is missing. And tier three, you can think of as an indicator that's a work in progress. Okay, so this is a dynamic development process. The indicators are developed by the interagency expert group on SDGs, and this is composed of, of um, member states from the UN, international organizations, regional organizations. Uh, and so when this paper was published in October 2019, there were 104 tier one indicators. So 104 indicators for which the data and methodology were established, 88 tier two, 34 tier three, and six multiple. That's because some indicators have multiple components, so they can uh, be uh, classified as more than one tier. But as of April 2020, as I mentioned, because this is a dynamic development process, there were some, tier, uh, some indicators were promoted. So now there's 115 tier one indicators, 95 tier two, and no longer any tier three indicators. Okay, so basically the, the takeaway message from this is that just under half of the indicators are still missing data. Okay, so where, where does the source of this data come from for the SDG indicators? So we can divide this into what we call traditional data and non-traditional data. So basically, the indicators are driven by traditional data. So this is data coming from national statistical offices. So this can be census, household surveys. It can come from international organizations like the World Bank, different UN agencies, as well as information from other ministries and government agencies. OK, but the problem with the traditional data, uh, it's costly to collect. Uh, it's not necessarily collected all that frequently, partly because of the cost, so the data can be outdated quite quickly. Um, there's some question about the veracity of some of this data. How, how good is some of this data, for example? Um, and it's not always necessarily the most trustworthy, okay? That, that's not all the data, but it's, it applies to some of the data. Um, and then finally, it's usually reported nationally, so we don't have spatially explicit data. Okay, then there's this, all this non-traditional data which could actually be used for, for SDGs. So we have earth observation data, satellite information. Now in, in some indicators, satellite information is already being used, but you could use drone imagery, you could use in-situ information, you could use spatial data infrastructure information. So this is all the national data that's sitting in national mapping agencies, for example, on roads, water layers, building layers, land cover, land use. There's a whole raft of commercial data that could be used for the SDGs. For example, mobile phone records, financial data. There's official sensor networks, and this is only going to increase with the Internet of Things, but telemetry data from hydrological stations, weather and air pollution stations, just to mention a few, but that will only increase in the future. And then finally, there's this 
this category of citizen generated data. So by citizen generated data, I mean data that are generated by citizens and their organizations, okay, when there is a problem that they want to tackle and they want to make a change. Okay, and within that citizen generated data sits citizen science. And, and that's the subject of this talk. Okay, so one of the things that we started out by doing was asking the question, well, what is the value of data from citizen science for the SDGs? Okay, so what we did is we analyzed it according to five dimensions. And actually, any kind of data set can be uh, analyzed by these dimensions. So I'm not going to go through this whole diagram. This diagram is in the paper, and there's more details in the paper if you want. But just picking up on a few of the dimensions, so for example, space and time. So space I mentioned, often the indicators are only at national level. Yet citizen science data can provide spatially explicit data, much more valuable than just a single number for a country. The time dimension. Uh, say you're getting a household survey done every 10 years. Citizen science data can be continuously collected. So vastly improving the temporal resolution of the data for, for the SDGs. Theme. Uh, I'm, citizen science data are often much richer than, um, than authoritative data. I use an example of OpenStreetMap. So OpenStreetMap is much richer than the corresponding authoritative databases that, that would be sitting, for example, in a national mapping agency. So this kind of richness, um, it, it could, could be really valuable for the SDGs. So basically, overall, there are benefits across the board in all these different dimensions um, from citizen science data to the SDGs. But sitting outside of that, of course, uh, is this issue of data quality. And I think it's one of the most important issues uh, raised about citizen science data, and, and it represents a real barrier to use. But just as we analyze the data by those five dimensions, of course, we can analyze the quality of citizen science data using the same sorts of methods we could use for geospatial data. So for example, using ISO standards. So we can report on the quality of the data very easily. But at the same time, there have been very, there have been a number of, met, uh, of innovative methods that have been developed by citizen science projects. I've listed a few here, but there are many others. So peer review, validation by experts, filtering of outliers, consensus-based methods when you've got um, data at um, uh, multiple locations, you can include the volunteer performance, you can use AI. So there's a whole series of different methods that have been developed in all these different projects. So I think the take home message for data quality is just good communication. Okay, so the other thing we did in the paper is consider examples. So, so Dilek is going to talk next and she's going to show you um, where citizen science is already contributing to some of the SDG indicators. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm just going to give you a few examples of potential. So tier two and what were previously tier three have of course the most potential because this is where the data are lacking. So here are just a few examples for, for example, in the Philippines, volunteers are already contributing to 32 SDG indicators by collecting household census data. So that's just a national level example, but this could be replicated to, to other countries. Another example is in Peru. Um, this is like a, an initiative that involves the volunteers for monitoring water quality. So that could, it isn't at the moment, but it could contribute to SDG 6.3.2 on, on improving water quality. Um, citizens could be involved in monitoring food waste. So there's all sorts of tools out there for food diaries, for example. So you could monitor food waste at the household level and contribute to SDG target 12.3. Another example is applications of climate smart agriculture. These could contribute to SDG indicator 13.3.2. So there's lots of examples out there that could contribute. Um, and and, and it's, it's, it's really just kind of understanding the, where, where these all are, for example, and then, and then seeing whether we can, can make a match. Okay, beyond the SDGs, there's also potential, because we know that SDGs are not a perfect framework. So if we take air pollution as an example, there's two indicators currently related to air pollution. So we've got 3.9.1. This is about mortality related to air pollution. Then we have 11.6.2. This is about measuring particulate matter, fine particulate matter for cities. Okay, but the problem is these indicators don't give any actionable information to cities or local communities about what they can do. They don't tell us anything about the impacts of air pollution and health. Yet we know there's, there's a whole raft of citizen science projects out there that are collecting information on air pollution and health. 
I've named a few, Curious Noses, this project that had 20,000 participants measuring air pollution uh, in Flanders, in Belgium. Propeller Health that links um, information from uh, <coughs> asthma, asthma inhalers with pollution. There's these new low-cost sensors measuring multiple pollution variables. I saw someone <laughs> registered there from SafeCast, so I didn't mention SafeCast, but there's Airbeam, there's Aircasting, there's DIY sensors. So there's a whole series of uh, potential sensors and projects out there. So you can imagine building a global network of projects on air quality that could complement the SDG framework. And then finally, we have to recognize that if we do want to integrate citizen science with the SDG process, we need a way forward and we need actions. We can't just sit back and expect this to happen. So uh, as part of this workshop and in the paper, we developed this roadmap. It's at three levels. So we have global, national and local. And then we have aims at each of these levels. So at the global level, it's integrating citizen science into the formal SDG reporting process. How can we do that? Well, it's, it's really a linear process. We start by identifying those candidate tier two indicators, uh, which are the ones that that, that citizen science could contribute towards. We then get that custodian agency or agencies on board. These, these are the agencies responsible for each of the indicators. We then identify the relevant citizen science projects and we bring them together with the scientists, with the custodian agencies, and we develop protocols that ensure that the data coming from the citizen science projects is of the, the right quality and fits the protocols for that indicator. And then we run a few pilot projects in the countries and if this is successful, this can be upscaled. So this is the process that actually happens right now for tier three indicators. So it's just fitting within that process. Then at the national level, the aim is to build an environment of trust for citizen science in national government agencies. So there's a whole series of actions that need to take place. One has actually already been done, map existing citizen science contributions to SDG indicators, and that's what Delic is gonna tell us about next. But there's a, a whole series of different things we can do promoting this dialogue on data quality, creating an inventory of good examples. I already mentioned a few like the one in the Philippines and putting those together and showcasing those so that ultimately we could integrate citizen science data streams into the practices of national statistical offices by building this trusted environment. And then finally, we work at the local level. So we would want to support local level SDG relevant citizen science projects. Okay, so in conclusion, I mentioned SDGs right now are largely monitored using these traditional data sources. So sources from national statistical offices, other government agencies, international organizations. But we've had this data revolution happen over the last decade. And there's now so many new non-traditional data sources available, including from citizen science, that we should be taking advantage of these for, for the SDGs. Contributions are definitely already in evidence, but the potential is there, particularly for these tier two indicators, those indicators where the data are still missing. But we need to work actively and we need to work at different levels. Hence, there's that roadmap that I presented. And really this, this data quality issue, it's one of the most important issues, has to be tackled head on in order to create this trusted environment. Okay, so there's the paper again. Please consult it. And if you have any questions, please enter in the chat or we have a discussion at the end. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Linda. And if folks noticed, um, I did provide the link to the paper in the chat box on the right, so you can scroll through that uh, to find it. And we also will be gathering all the links from the speakers to include in a resource document at the end uh, that we'll share. Uh, I forgot to mention, so please add your questions in the Q&A uh, section. There's a little Q&A icon at the bottom of the nav navigation bar in Zoom. Uh, that you can click on that and enter your question. Panelists can read it as they go and type in answers. But we also will be answering those questions verbally at the end. And if you can't find that icon, we will be scanning the chat box for questions as well. We'll save our questions to the end of the presentations and then hopefully have a discussion from there. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Delek Frizel. She's a research scholar at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria as well as a PhD candidate at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. Delek chairs the We Observe SDGs and Citizen Science Community of Practice and co-chairs the Citizen Science Global Partnerships SDGs and Citizen Science Maximization Group, which is a global group of uh, practitioners and researchers. With that, I will hand it over to Delek. 
Thank you very much, Leah, for the introduction. And um, thank you, uh, Rihanna, as well, for organizing this and inviting me as a speaker. I had to uh, switch off my camera uh, because I'm really uh, a little bit uncomfortable about the fact that my internet connection may not be so good. So I was experiencing some problems lately. So um, actually, I would also um, like to thank everyone for joining. Um, Linda provided a, a very good overview on the SDG indicator framework, data gaps and needs, and the issues around the current sources of uh, data that are used to monitor progress on the SDGs, and how citizen science as a new source of data or citizen generated data could contribute to SDG monitoring. I will now deep dive into the topic a little bit, as Linda mentioned, and present to you a systematic review that we undertook at IESA in collaboration with UNEP and many other partners on the contribution of citizen science to SDG monitoring. So the main goal of my presentation today is to show you on uh, show you where exactly citizen science is already contributing or could contribute data to the SDG indicator framework. We also um, want to provide, um, or I will also provide some concrete recommendations for how to bring citizen science data into the scope of official statistics. So um, there has been research in the past that focuses on the contribution of citizen science to the SDGs, but either uh, these studies were either at the goals level or at the targets level, or they have been providing only a few cases that show the connection between the two. This is the first and only comprehensive uh, overview to my knowledge that shows which of the SDG indicators could be supported by which citizen science initiatives. S sorry. Um, but now, uh, what I would, what I'm showing you right now is the, um, is basically a link to the We Observe SDGs and Citizen Science Community of Practice. Um, I would like to mention this to you today because this uh, study that I'm presenting right now is, um, is done uh, through this SDGs and citizen science community of practice, which we call in short SDG SCOP. Uh, this is a project, uh, this is uh, uh, basically funded by the um, European Commission funded We Observe project. And um, this is an open platform that connects citizen science practitioners and researchers, national statistical office representatives, as well as UN and other international agency representatives um, to share and exchange knowledge and resources on how to demonstrate the value of citizen science data and impact for SDG achievement. So um, you are more than welcome to join our uh, SDG scope and I guess uh, Rihanna will kindly put the link in the chat um, for, for this. And now I would like to tell you very briefly about, if you go back to the, um, the research that I was telling you about, this is basically submitted to a peer review journal um, and now currently in review. And, and the methodology that we, uh, that we used in this uh, paper you see right now on the slide, we first had a look at the uh, whole SDG indicators. At that time, we're, we, we were undertaking this study, there were 244 SDG indicators. We reviewed their metadata and work plan, and we searched for citizen science projects. Um, and we, you, for these citizen science projects, we took an all-encompassing approach and identified um, as citizen science, citizen generated data, community-based monitoring, volunteer geographic information, or all crowd, crowdsourcing initiatives. And we then categorize them in terms of their contribution to the SDG indicator framework as either already contributing or could contribute or there's no alignment at present. Then we went, to, we went through a, a peer review process where co-authors reviewed each other's work. Uh, on the mapping. Uh, and then we went through another peer review process, which was initially led by uh, myself as the lead author of the paper, where I reviewed um, all the co-authors um, mapping. And then uh, after that, uh, the chief statistician of the UN environment, um, Jillian Campbell, um, has went through the mapping of uh, all the other co-authors to make sure that our results are statistically um, valid. And this is, in this slide, you see the results of our work. Um, the yellow boxes you see here show the indicators that could benefit from citizen science data, and green boxes show the indicators that citizen science data are already contributing to. 
uh, green one, sorry, and gray means we couldn't identify any alignment with any past or ongoing citizen science initiatives. So according to that, uh, we can say that citizen science data um, are already contributing to the monitoring of five SDG indicators and could contribute to 76 indicators, which is together about 33% of the whole SDG indicators. And our assessment shows that the greatest contribution of citizen science to the SDG framework would be in SDG 15, I'm counting them respectively, um, life, life on land with 64%, and then uh, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities with 60%, and then uh, SDG 3 on health, and SDG 6 water. These also demonstrate that citizen science data have the greatest potential for input to the environmental SDG indicators, actually. UNEP has identified within the SDG indicator framework, there are 93 environmental SDG indicators, and our results show that citizen science could provide input for about 40% of them. And now I would like to give you a few examples on um, where these actually contributions are happening or could happen uh, according to our uh, findings. For instance, um, this slide is about uh, SDG indicator 1411 on um, marine plastic. So this is an indicator that uh, has two sub indicators. The first one is about coastal eutrophication and the second part is about floating plastic debris density, which is actually marine litter. UN Environment, the custodian agency for this indicator has recently developed a methodology that uses citizen science as a primary source of data for measuring marine litter. And this has been approved by the interagency expert group on SDG indicators that Linda mentioned in October 2019 at a meeting where we were also presenting the results of our work that I'm presenting right now. And is, in terms of an individual project, I would like to bring litter intelligence to your attention. This is a large scale citizen science program led by sustainable coastlines in New Zealand. The initiative uh, has been collaborating with the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Environment, Statistics New Zealand and the Department of Conservation since the design phase of the program in 2016. And they are, the data sets resulting from this project are included in the official SDG monitoring report and also the the official environmental report of um, Statistics uh, New Zealand. Um, there are, of course, many other examples. As I mentioned, we identified in total 81 uh, initiatives or 81 uh, different indicators that could benefit or uh, already benefiting from citizen science data, but I cannot talk about all of them. So I picked two more examples here, one of which is the SDG indicator 1.5.2. This is about quantifying direct economic loss attributed to disaster. Um, uh, and the metadata for this indicator defines the direct economic loss as the monetary value of destruction, total or partial destruction of physical assets uh, existing in an affected area. So this is all about uh, physical damage. There are many citizen science initiatives uh, that could help uh, quantifying damage. This is our, in our paper, as I said, that is currently under review, the other initiatives. But I would like to give you one example from IASA's own picture pile tool uh, for post-disaster damage assessment. This is a project where volunteers classify satellite images to identify damaged buildings after a disaster occurs. Um, another powerful example is on water quality. This is the indicator 6.3.2. This indicator aims to measure the proportion of water bodies in a country with good water quality. Um, there's an established methodology for this indicator, of course, but the data are not regularly produced um, because it requires substantial investments in financial and human resources um, to organize uh, routine data collection activities at high spatial and temporal resolutions. And uh, I could uh, basically mention uh, initiatives such as Freshwater Watch uh, that could provide meaningful contributions to the monitoring of this indicator, uh, as well as uh, other water quality monitoring um, citizen science initiatives. Um, in our mapping, um, we identify 
some that that some indicators could be more amenable to citizen science than others. For instance, the environmental SDG indicators that were identified by UN Environment, as I mentioned before. And there are other groups of uh, other groups of indicators. One group is uh, the indicators that could benefit from observations, such as bird and biodiversity monitoring. Um, I put a few examples here for the indicators that are related to protected areas. These are already benefiting from citizen science data for the monitoring of at the global level. And and um, that are all, there are also indicators um, or the category of indicators that could be supported by spatial data. This could be monitoring of water quality, which I just mentioned, air quality that Linda mentioned, and disease threats or post-disaster damage assessment or open spaces in cities. And there are others as well, for instance, indicators that could be supplemented through self-reporting, such as sexual violence in SDG 16 or perception of safety. Um, more generically, um, indicators measuring issues that raise a concern among citizens and communities um, seem to be more amenable to citizen science approaches because that uh, they could directly affect or are affecting their health, environment, and quality of life. Um, so uh, in terms of way forward, Linda uh, summarized this very nicely. I'm not going to go through into detail, but what I would like to say is um, building awareness and sharing experiences on the use of citizen science for the SDGs is an important component, which we identified is lacking within the citizen science community, as well as the national statistical offices for many reasons. That's the reason why we basically um, established this uh, SDGs and citizen science community of practice. As I mentioned, that you're all welcome to join our monthly meetings and also you can help us uh, you can support our the production of outputs like these papers these two papers we have been presenting and developing case studies or success stories where citizen science data have been used in innovative ways by nso's which we actually started in ghana with uh, ghana statistical service you know and fao uh, together with sdsn trends um, funded by them, uh, where we are actually implementing the results of the uh, mapping exercise that I was mentioning, um, of course, considering the requirements and data needs of the Ghana Statistical Service. I think um, um, this is this is what I can tell at the moment. Uh, I don't want to run over. Um, but what I would like to say, uh, finalizing, we were particularly, or the, the main topic of this uh, conversation is about the SDG monitoring, but we should also say that citizen science also has great potential in terms of mobilizing citizens and uh, achieving the SDGs if we want to, if we really want to transform the way we live uh, for SDG achievement. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Dilek. That was awesome. Uh, and uh, Dilek, maybe remember to put in any links into the side chat uh, that uh, you mentioned in your talk. Wonderful. With that, we're going to be turning to Dr. Jean Holm. She's a senior technology advisor to the mayor. And Jean, am I right in saying you're now the chief information officer for the city of Los Angeles? You just got a big promotion, right? So congratulations. Uh, as the former evangelist for data.gov, which was an open government flagship project for the White House, uh, Jean led collaboration and built communication uh, communities with the public, educators, developers, and governments in using open government data. She's also a distinguished instructor at UCLA and the co-chair of the Africa Open Data Community. With that, I'll hand it over to Jean. Great, thank you so much, Leah. And I'm the chief data officer. So uh, I'm very happy to have that new role in Los Angeles, uh, which is my hometown. So I wanna talk a little bit more about sort of how the rubber meets the road when we're really trying to implement uh, citizen science in a metropolitan area and how that works. So I'm just going to give you some examples about how we're doing that. And, uh, and there's, uh, like any big effort, there's lots of great people who I'm working with that are part of the team. So a shout out to Ava, Dawn, Aaron, and Anthony, as well as I see Vivian and Angela on. Vivian's with our library and uh, in Los Angeles, and Angela's with SafeCast, one of our partners. So some of the things that we're doing is, um, first of all, Los Angeles, like many countries, has adopted the Sustainable Development Goals as a framework. So we actually have done significant work over the last several years with generous uh, support from the Hilton Foundation to look at how the SDGs can have uh, an impact in a city, so not just at the national level, 
we actually did a pretty thorough mapping from the 169 indicators down to our individual indicators uh, that are, make sense for a city because not everything uh, works at the um, at the local level that is also uh, happening at the national level. Um, the website that you can find this at is sdg.lamayor.org and it's linked from all these slides as well as uh, stated on them. So we looked at all the 17 indicators and then uh, we actually picked up an open source version of uh, some software provided by data.gov. Uh, and we, uh, if you click on any of the indicators on our website, you will actually get back into all of the background detail. And so I'm just showing you here, for example, indicator 11, which is sustainable cities, which is obviously one that's important to us. Uh, and you can see our red, yellow, green status of each of the targets and then the indicators and how we're measuring. And we think this is really important because we engage citizens in many aspects of what we're doing with SDGs. And we really need them to uh, be, we really need to be clear with people how we're measuring them and what we're holding people accountable for. So if somebody is expecting one thing on gender quality, equality, but we're measuring something else, we just want to be really clear with that. And if we need to measure something else, then we can have an open conversation with it. So I think this kind of level of rather detailed transparency is actually really helpful in, being, in having people be able to step forward as citizen scientists and as advocates for, our, for groups to be able to say, hey, you're, we think you're missing something and, and being able to be really clear where we think we've been um, successful or where we still need to improve. So I'm going to talk about a few projects just around a couple of the indicators, but ones that I think are important. So the first one um, really aligns up what, with what we were talking about earlier in the session, which is around air quality. So uh, we, one of the big indicators around air quality is understanding the impact our policies have around improving air quality. And so we are the happy recipients of a large grant from NASA uh, called Predicting What We Breathe. And this is using machine learning to understand urban air quality in Los Angeles, but then to extrapolate it to cities around the globe. So what we do is we combine some of the very data sets that uh, we started off with today. It was, it was a very uh, connected uh, session here. Uh, looking at satellite data from satellites like MODIS and Terra, and we're working with uh, Maya, which is a satellite that NASA is about to launch. Uh, we look at all that satellite data, and then we combine it with our, our Internet of Things data on the ground. So this includes partners like the South Coast Air Quality Management District, which has large uh, air quality sensors around the Los Angeles area. Um, it also SafeCast is a partner and particularly uh, fundamental to how we're approaching citizen science on this project. And Smart Air LA is another partner around citizen science. So SafeCast, as uh, many of you have heard before, provides amazing um, sensors. And we are actually working through our libraries to let people check out these sensors and to also place them at our libraries so that we can look at how we might be able to help people become more aware and participate in the understanding of air quality. This is really essential for us because although the satellites cover all of Los Angeles, they cover it at such a grand level that we don't get the granular data we need. So if we do tree planting in one neighborhood and we want to see how it uh, what a benefits effects it has. It's very hard to do that when you have a 30 kilometer swath of satellite data. Instead, what we're doing is combining it with this ground data sensor. Many sensors are around the city, on our street lights, our trash trucks, but we also wanna invest it with citizen science, particularly in the areas that are gaps. So SafeCast sensors are one way, and the Smart Air LA works with companies like Propeller Health, which was mentioned earlier, to be able to aggregate and anonymize data that's coming back from inhalers to be able to uh, understand air quality issues. And that's particularly important around our port of Los Angeles. So this is a really great way where we can take data that anybody in any city around the globe can get access to, which is NASA satellite data, apply machine learning on that in an area where we're really rich in ground data sensors, combine both citizen science and uh, governmental scientists and uh, community scientists to be able to put together that data in ways that would tell a city that doesn't have as much granular data what the satellite data is telling. So this is really useful when we talk to Mumbai or Nairobi, um, Kampala, I saw Uganda is on today, um, to be able to kind of share that with what we're calling our air quality sister cities around the globe. 
one of our secret weapons in being able to do a lot of data science work, and particularly the work that we did around the SDGs, is our Data Science Federation. So this is a group of 18 universities that we recruited professors and students from. Um, and each year we put out a call for proposals from our city departments. And that could be from zoo, our aging, our transportation, and our sanitation. And we partner real projects that really need to get done with innovative data solutions and young people and professors who have amazing ideas and really want to make an impact in their in their community. And we've been very successful at making a lot of changes and uh, really bringing in new ideas. Just this month, we've expanded that to 193 other cities around Southern California. And so it's just a little bit of, uh, it'll be very interesting year as we bring in all of those projects. And of course, some of those will be focused around uh, COVID. Uh, and so this lets people sort of do homework for their hometown and has been really fundamental. We had a, a multi-year data science federation project around the SDGs where we had groups of students come in on a longer term basis from Occidental College and others to be able to look at and unravel how those indicators really related locally and to help us do some of the gap analysis. Around the indicator for good health and well-being um, is a citizen science project we're doing right now. So um, we are in the middle of a two-week COVID computational challenge. So this is a challenge that we have been putting together because we realize that around COVID data, there's a lot of information, but but one of the things that is not well understood is when you when the economies are starting to reopen and safer at home orders are getting adjusted to let people out more, then people have a fundamental question, where is it safest to go in my city? And, and we don't really know. We know where people are who have been or are sick, but we don't necessarily know where the highest risk is. So this computational challenge, we've got about 40 teams currently competing from all over the world. We have uh, training coming from uh, GIS companies like Esri and SafeGraph. We have uh, epidemiologists from the County Public Health and UCLA Computational Medicine. And we're really working, and our, our MDS is our co-sponsor, their community organizer for data science in Los Angeles. And so this group is really going to come up with uh, prototype solutions for how are we going to be able to give people the information about which place is it safer to go. If I want to go to the beach, is this beach less busy today than that beach? If I want to go to a mall, which mall is less busy today and which is having uh, less infections of COVID? So we're really excited about this and we'll be open sourcing this as well. And then finally, a huge shout out to our library. Um, so we do a variety of citizen science projects for all ages. And I just kind of want to note that while we often talk about very high end data science projects and citizen science projects like the ones I just mentioned, that all of those start with people who are young and are curious and want to try something and are brave. And these are just pictures of some of the folks in our libraries and out with our um, uh, augmented reality app called Agents of Discovery that are exploring our parks and natural places to capture virtual animals and learn about them. Are there in our maker spaces at our libraries or our new Octavia lab learning about 3D printing and doing podcasts and really getting a chance to um, try and, and succeed and try and fail and try and do something different and um, we're just so, so grateful to have a set of librarians and folks who are part of that teaching program. Uh, one of the things that we also do is the library provides the tools that people need wherever they need it. So this program where people might be able to check out the SafeCast sensors at the library, take them home, set them up, as well as the ability for Tech2Go, which is being able to get check out a computer and a Wi-Fi hotspot. We have a lot of communities where only 50% of households with internet connectivity. And, and part of our work around digital inclusion is really around getting people access, getting them connectivity, and then giving them digital and data literacy so that they become curious and capable and can explore the world around them. So thanks for listening. If anybody wants to share on any of those projects um, or be a partner on any of our projects, just reach out to me. We'd love to have you. Wonderful, thank you, Jean.
greatly uh, uh, appreciate your, your fabulous talk and it's just amazing. I've, I've been talking with you about the Data Science Federation now I think for a year, year and a half and to see the exponential growth and the impact you're having. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hope I, I hope I, yeah, that's a lot of cities, but it's, it's a good time to expand. We have some great partners. Well, you know, I think we were always talking about how do we expand that across the country? So we can get to that during the Q&A, and I'm going to now uh, move to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Alex uh, Sherbinen. He's the Associate Director for Science Applications and Senior Research uh, Scientist at the Center for International Earth Science and Information Network or SEASON for short, which is an environmental data and analysis center with the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Alex also serves as deputy manager of the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, CDAC. Uh, and I'm on their user group. I'd have to say it's one of the best run groups I have ever participated in. Uh, he's also the chair of the scientific committee of the International Science Council World Data System and co-chair of the ISC uh, WDS CoData Citizen Science Data Task Force. And with that, I hand it over to Alex. And again, uh, we'll be doing all the Q&A at the end of this presentation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Leah. This was uh, really stimulating. I've really enjoyed the presentations thus far um, and looking forward to the conversation afterwards. So um, by way of background, CODATA and WDS or World Data System are two bodies that are um, under the International Science Council, what used to be called ICSU or an International Committee for uh, Science Unions. And they changed their name uh, two or three years ago. And uh, we've been, uh, both organizations, which I have different roles in, are uh, actually sort of, um, involved in the data space, CODATA more on the policy side, whereas in, in these task groups, which um, they sponsor, and World Data System is more about data repositories uh, and the work that uh, the, the archives uh, are doing globally. There's about 80 members around the world and growing. Uh, we do certification of repositories and things like that to make sure that data are well preserved. So a little background on our, our current task group, which is really focused on citizen science for SDGs. Uh, we have to go back to 2017, where we uh, had set up originally a group on uh, use of uh, basically the, the data practices in the citizen science community writ large, including those who are involved in crowdsourcing and, and volunteer geographic information. And what we wanted to do was characterize the potential and challenges of these developments for science as a whole and data science in particular. So we had interviews with 30 projects uh, around the world trying to get a pretty good representative sample of different regions, different thematic areas. So in other words, not just biodiversity focus, but also things like air pollution or litter. Uh, and we wanted to assess the methods and approaches for validating the various streams of citizen science data, the mechanisms for cleaning and curating the data, and the systems in place for the long-term management and documentation and dissemination of those data. And then in 2019, we reconstituted the task group to focus more on the SDGs, but as you'll see, we're still wrapping up some of the work under the first iteration of our task group. The current membership is on the right-hand side. I won't list everyone for the sake of time, but you can see who's involved, including some of these, uh, some of them, uh, some of our colleagues from South Africa are on the line today. So uh, welcome. And um, I should mention that the work on the first task group, uh, a journal article that we're producing uh, and will be out soon, hopefully in the Journal of Citizen Science, uh, was led by Ann Bowser. Ian involves Karen Cooper, myself, uh, Andrea, um, sorry, I'm gonna blank on her name, but Wiggins, everybody knows Andrea, uh, and uh, a number of people who were part of the first group, which includes some of the names on the right-hand side, uh, Peter Brenton as well from Australia. Um, so one of the things that makes this space very complex in, ter in terms of data management practices is that, first of all, citizen science, as we've already heard, covers so many different domains, includes so many different actors, and has so many different types of outputs, with data just being one of many different types of outputs. 
uh, and maybe not even the one of greatest importance to some of the citizen science groups. So this makes characterizing the practices particularly difficult. What we sought to do was look across um, a number of different aspects of data management that are relevant to uh, citizen science uh, and really all science in general. And uh, so these would include things like, how do you acquire the data? What are the data quality management or pr processing approaches to validation, QA, QC? What kind of data infrastructure do you have? Uh, what are the data security uh, measures put in place? How do you govern the data? Aspects of privacy protection and, and ethics, um, data documentation and metadata, uh, especially around what goes into the data sets data access in terms of open or fair data, um, and then data services, what kind of services may be built upon the data sets, like think of OpenStreetMap, which has a wonderful service that's been around for at least 10 to 12 years, and uh, data integration, uh, the, the ability to uh, have interoperable data with standard formats. So we were looking at these various aspects through the survey we developed and what we found in that first task group was that projects are implementing best practices with regard to volunteer data collection and validation, uh, but that they're not often so aware of best practices with regard to data management such as data curation, documentation, and long-term preservation. Uh, the prevalence of best practices in data management with citizen science data may not actually be that different from the practices in the broader uh, conventional science community. But one of the things that Linda C. mentioned was the importance and the critical importance of developing trust in the data. And so when the citizen science community may be falling short, it could actually be uh, perceived by outsiders as casting doubt on the validity of the data that are being produced. Uh, and so we feel that widespread identification, publication, and adoption of best practices in citizen science data collection and validation would provide much needed transparency about rigorous practices and go a long way to advancing the reputation of the field. And that work on, on supporting data management needs to be carried forward. I think the CSA, both in the US and Europe and Australia and other citizen science associations around the world are really critical for, for advancing this dialogue. Um, one of the reasons we found that a lot of projects may not be using traditional best practices of scientific uh, data management uh, are for valid reasons. And these include data collection is often determined by local needs and projects are uh, collaboratively designed between professional researchers and volunteers. So there could be a really strong environmental justice focus on a project that really meets the needs of the end users, but doesn't really focus on how the data that are being developed are being preserved over the long term or, or being validated. Uh, the primary constituency and stakeholders are often groups of volunteers and they may not be, they may be perfectly happy with the way that the data are treated currently and there may be no demand in essence for better data management practices. And the stakeholders also change over time, so the practices will change. Uh, and one of the things we have to realize is that, you know, citizen science relative to conventional science is kind of in its infancy. So we need to recognize that it will take time for some of these practices to take hold. And also that this requires time and resources and money and that a lot of the uh, impetus for early citizen science work was really uh, an enthusiasm for the, uh, for the work on the ground and involving citizens and the kind of nitty gritty of data management and things like that may not have been uh, an impetus for a lot of the early uh, adopters. Um, so moving forward, it will be critical for people to su um, support effective uh, citizen science data practices and acknowledge the unique attributes of these contexts. So looking at what we're doing currently, our group has only been around for a little over a year. Uh, took us actually some time just to map out what's being done in this terrain of uh, citizen science for the SDGs. And as, as we've heard already, there's just a lot going on. So we were aware of Dillick's work and we became more aware of some of the other things, which were actually initially on our proposed agenda for the group. And then we realized, well, actually someone's doing that very well, so we don't need to contribute in that area. So we basically came down to three different areas and I'm just gonna describe those very briefly. Uh, the first is essentially to wrap up what we did under the initial group. Uh, get a journal article out, um, produce a, a short list of effective practices uh, for the community, 
hold some workshops in conjunction with CSA meetings and educate community about best practices. And this is just an idea that we have of developing perhaps an RDA or Research Data Alliance Birds of Feather group on citizen science data for the SDGs. Um, if there's someone in this community that would like to take a lead in that area is already involved perhaps with RDA, uh, I'd love to hear more and you can send me a, a chat message or take my email down at the end of the presentation. Um, the second goal of our SDG group is to uh, develop um, essentially translate SDG indicator language for as citizen science groups so that they can better contribute in different issue areas. And we're going to focus on four areas in particular, water, health, slum, slums and biodiversity or urban and biodiversity. And those are reflected in the three SDGs, 3, 11, 13 and 15. What we really want to do is put handles on data indicator needs of the UN and national government so that citizen science groups can more effectively measure the SDGs. Um, if anyone's read the metadata or the documentation that goes with some of these SDG indicators, um, it's often very opaque and uh, can be difficult for average people, even scientists in some case, cases, to understand exactly what needs to be collected and how. So we're hoping to uh, develop better guidance that would be distributed to uh, both, both via sort of UN organizations um, and uh, you know, validate that with the UN custodian organizations first and then publicize these guidelines to different, through different venues. Um, the other and last pillar or goal of our work is to focus on Africa. Uh, as you know, the SDGs are uh, universal, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which only focus on developed countries. And um, the, the result is that some countries or certain regions of the world really, um, while, while um, SDGs are universal, we know that some regions like Africa are particularly falling behind in certain um, SDGs. So what we're doing right now is we're developing a survey of African countries that aims to better understand what is happening in the region vis-a-vis -vis citizen science for the SDGs and contributing to, uh, we want to also contribute metadata to on the citizen science efforts in Africa to databases such as SciStarter. So we're using the PPSR core as a way of coding our results. Um, so we want to identify where CS, uh, citizen science data may contribute concretely to development interventions. So we want to actually sh demonstrate that this is really being used in different ways. And we want to um, see also where the data may already be included by official government statistics or in report. And finally, we want to write up the results and share in blog posts and potentially through a journal article at the end of this effort. So finally, uh, I want to just mention that uh, Ann Bowser, myself, and Sven Shade from, uh, I, I believe it's EASA or JRC, sorry, uh, he's at the European Union's, uh, European Commission's Joint Research Center in ISPRA, uh, are developing this special issue where we're the editors of a special issue of Frontiers uh, in, uh, in this case, is a research topic on open citizen science data and methods. Uh, Frontiers is very enthusiastic about this and we encourage everyone on this call if you're developing either have a project and you want to describe the methods that you're using to collect data uh, or you have a data report in other words essentially a description or a descriptor about a data set that has been collected by your project we really encourage you to uh, go to this link and, and submit even if you just submit an abstract that's a way to kind of put a placeholder and then first come first serve we have a lot of free um, uh, we have some ability to waive the fees for the open uh, access journal uh, articles. So if you get in early um, and you pro provide a really good quality abstract that, that seems really enticing to the community, then we, we'd be happy to, to give you a, a, a waiver on that, that publication fee. So here's my contact information. I'll put that in the chat as well. And uh, welcome any questions at the, uh, during the question and answer period. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Alex. I invite all panelists now to turn on their cameras and uh, sound so we can hear. Uh, we have nine questions in the queue, so we'll go through as many as we can given the time. I think we have about 15 more minutes. Uh, first question is for Delec. Thank you for presenting this impressive analysis. 
uh, as I know Linda C and many of the other colleagues were also involved in these papers and, and really applaud uh, Dilek for her leadership in taking things forward. Thank you for presenting this impressive analysis. In your last sentence, you made the important point about citizen science being able to contribute to achieving the SDGs as well as monitoring. In the future, will your initiative track citizen science projects that are doing this? And are you aware of quantitative measures of impact on sustainable development that could be used to assess the contributions of citizen science projects for achieving the SDGs? Dilak, I'll let you answer, and then if the other panelists might want to jump in on that as well. Thank you so much for the question. And um, I think this is very relevant. The, um, when we set up this or established this SDGs community of practice, we identified or we co-designed uh, our objectives together with the participants. And there were two important points that everybody within the group um, or in the launch event that uh, were quite interested in um, addressing. One was the SDG monitoring, so how citizen science data could contribute to SDG monitoring efforts. And the other objective was to identify the impact of citizen science for SDG achievement. Um, so we were focusing on so far, of course, to finalize the first objective or do um, the task for the first objective, which is currently under review, the work that I presented. Now we want to focus on the other uh, end of the spectrum where we would like to identify what are, when, when we're talking about, we're talking about a lot of impact of citizen science and we say citizen science could help change behaviors or participation in citizen science initiatives, for instance, but how this could happen and where it happened and um, how we need to um, basically establish our citizen science initiatives so that we could make sure that this is happening. Um, this is um, actually, a work that we will start soon. So if you are interested in joining that effort, you're more than welcome to join SDG Scope as well. And as part of the We Observe uh, project, we have other communities of practice, one of which is actually looking at the impact of citizen science on policy. Um, if you are interested in that, in that I would like to uh, join that effort as well, or that community of practice as well. So uh, in short, the answer is yes. And I'm aware of some of the study, studies in the uh, field of marine uh, litter or uh, beach cleanups or uh, these sort of citizen science initiatives. But this is an area that we need to study a little bit more in detail to really understand what could be the contribution of citizen science initiatives um, to SDG achievement. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Linda, Jean, Alex? Anyone else uh, like to jump in on that one? No? Okay, we'll move to the next question. Uh, Mashpet, Mashpet, uh, are, are there any frameworks, indicators, factors used to describe successful citizen science? If yes, which ones, any useful resources? I'll take that one, Leah. <laughs> Uh, I think that's Mercy from Uganda. Uh, oh. I think that's her screen name. Um, so I put in the chat a link to a group that Leah led on the Federal Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing Toolkit, which I think is a really great beginner's guide to how to do uh, citizen science projects that connect to actual standards that scientists use. So it's a great way to make, th there's a lot of citizen science projects that are just for education or awareness, but the really amazing opportunities are when they can augment or fill in gaps in the scientific community, but they need to be done in such a way that scientists can accept that data. Uh, so I think that's a great toolkit. I saw some of the code data postings as well. So I think some of the other people have posted there. And then I just wanted to ask Mercy to, I dropped you my email in the chat too, to just contact me about the work that you're doing in Uganda. It sounds really interesting. And uh, that's fantastic. Should mention also that Uta Ven, who couldn't join us today, but was one of the co-contributors to the SDG paper that both uh, Linda and Dilek were discussing, also is doing work in Africa. And I think you see Alex, you're waving your finger. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, one of the things, uh, given that this is a question coming from Africa, and that I'm really curious about as we develop our uh, work in, in the survey uh, out of the University of Lagos is, what are the incentives that um, the incentives that 
uh, lead citizens, citizens to really engage in a project and actually continue to carry it out. Now, what I sense is in, in many parts of Africa that there are donors who come in and set up, say, data development sprees, uh, data blitzes, uh, crowdsourcing initiatives, or they, go, they develop some kind of biodiversity focused citizen science effort, but it's all donor funded. And when the donor money disappears, the effort kind of withers. Now that also, I think, is an issue in many developed countries as well. So it's not unique to Africa. But I'd really be curious, I think an indicator could be, is an effort really sustainable? And does it continue to generate data over time? I think particularly in the area of the SDGs, if an uh, initiative simply um, goes for three or four years and then ceases to produce data, that's another credibility gap. You, you, you simply can't be in the business for three or four years. I mean, that could be useful for a short period, and I'm not saying it's not useful, but I think that to really be helpful and uh, successful long-term, you need monitoring over longer time periods. I'd be interested if other panelists have thoughts on that as well. Would anyone like to jump in on that one? Um, sure, I'll just follow on to that. So. Uh, I did a, I, I lead a group called Africa Open Data that has monthly webinars around some of these things. We did a project recently with a Open Data Institute grant that was around clean streets. So it was a process we did in Los Angeles that helped citizens uh, through a mobile app be able to recommend where sanitation problems were happening. And so we actually took the basic methodology and then let people innovate on that for Kampala, for Bo Sierra Leone, and for Accra, Ghana. And each of them came up with very different uh, solutions, one of which involved a, hiring all the Boda Boda drivers to take pictures of the trash heaps, um, which I thought was very creative. And, uh, and so I think, you know, the idea of creating, you know, sort of instant projects that, that give instant resources and gratification is one thing, but sustaining it over time, part of part of what we did is we orchestrated it so that it had to connect to the municipal trash pickup system so that it wasn't just people gathering data, but the data had action. And then it, especially in Accra, it's continued on really well as a way of kind of being able to sustain that. But yeah, you have to build sustainability in at the very beginning or else it doesn't work. We're gonna move on to the next question. Um, uh, Holly Cole asks, could you please put that Frontiers URL in the chat? Maybe you've already done it, but it might be worth doing it one more time. Uh, Luigi says, hi, Delec. What do you think is the best way to increase the presence of citizen science and SDG monitoring? So actually, maybe we'll loop in Linda on this as well. Uh, more papers, more large European projects, networking of small projects, awareness raising via CSA, EXA, and AXA, which are the different citizen science associations around the world. What else? And what about doing this in the global south, where SDGs are more relevant, but where citizen science is much less present than in Europe, Australia, and the US? Shall I give it a go, or um, Linda? Um... Um, okay, uh, I think Luigi, you mentioned them all very well. These were actually some of the things we also identified as part of our work uh, that I was presenting before. So uh, we were talking about we need to increase awareness um, within the citizen science community as well as among the uh, national statistical offices and UN agencies on the use of or potential of citizen science for SDG monitoring. And um, we were, um, we were also talking about developing case studies, more papers, maybe that's what's needed. Um, and uh, Linda uh, showed a very good, very nice slide where we um, highlighted in the nature sustainability uh, paper on what needs to be done on that front, uh, how we could work with the global, um, uh, at the global level or at the national level uh, for the adoption of citizen science data. Um, I think, um, in terms of Global South, yes, you're right. Uh, what we would also like to do is um, basically extend this work and spread this work that we're doing or like basically 
to create, first of all, the enabling environment that we always say, and this is like the famous, uh, famous framing within the data and statistics community. So we really need to create the enabling environment for the uptake of citizen science data for the uh, for SDG monitoring. And I guess it's all about uh, also partnerships. So when we are um, designing our citizen science initiatives, we need to make sure that if, uh, the, if we want the result uh, is feeding into the um, um, policy, then we need to start working with the national statistical offices or UN agencies as Linda was presenting. Um, this was uh, the example that I provided on marine litter, litter, in, litter intelligence. They are actually success lie uh, exactly on that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dilek. Um, I see we're, we're running a little bit out of time, but there's some really good questions here. So panelists, if you're not answering uh, verbally, maybe you could take a peek and see if there are any questions for you. You could answer uh, by typing it in. So I'm going to jump ahead to a really fabulous question by uh, Ashtosh Chatterjee. Uh, hi, first of all, thanks for extremely inspiring presentations. As a technologist in the SDG business, I find that technologists focus very heavily on the technology aspects, but not enough on the need for human centricity in data collection. This leads to underrepresentation of large segments of the population. For example, in the recent cyclone Amphan aftermath, people who had access to smartphones were the ones marking themselves safe on Facebook, but the worst affected people were conspicuously uh, missing uh, by their silence. Are there any patterns around such problem and any insights on what you feel are good solutions within the citizen science community? Have we stumped all the panelists? Yeah, you stumped the jumps. Um, I, I think uh, <laughs> um, we've been looking at whether uh, smartphone data could be used to track people after um, major flood or other, um, even in pandemics, um, using some, some pilot funding we have from the Schmidt Futures Foundation. And um, it's really tricky in some countries um, because of the, precisely because there's such biases in, in reporting. So, I mean, I know some interesting work uh, that's being done using Facebook check-in data, for instance, to track uh, migrants out of Venezuela. Um, but we know that there were gonna be inevitably some in this kind of crowdsourcing uh, effort world or use of social media and big data I think there's always gonna be gaps and, and we just have to be aware that there are biases in the data. Um, that goes probably as well for efforts to use smartphone apps to collect data in developing countries. There may need to be less data intensive ways because people are paying for their minutes using SIM cards that are expensive, uh, less expensive ways for them to collect the data, maybe through text or other meeting, means to report, uh, report their findings. So just a few thoughts. Um, this is Jean. In one of the instances when we were working, I was working in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, and we were doing a few projects where folks would be able to uh, download our uh, information and then upload data periodically. So uh, rather than, so this worked really well with some farmers that we were working with in rural Uganda, they would come into the village community center where there was some internet connectivity and then they could get information and then they go back out into the field. So we, we found that sometimes periodic connectivity was working well. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, well, I, what I actually would like to comment on that too. We have found that uh, in the crisis mapping space, which is you know crowdsourced uh, social media curation for example, that when they look at power outages, um, the people reporting it are, again, the ones that are you know, more well off and have the smartphones and things to report. And that uh, by, by relying too heavily on that data, they're missing out on different populations. So I think this, this topic has been addressed within the crisis mapping and crisis informatics community as well. Frank Yanni, uh, question to Delec, but I think this is something for all the panelists, so whoever wants to jump in. Um, it's Frank from Water Resource Management Authority in Zambia. Uh, 
delivered an excellent presentation. What are some of the key challenges that citizen science monitoring may face in a society where citizens may feel that they need to be paid for their work that they're doing? What are some of the innovative ways to get around this challenge since citizens need to see this as their contribution to their community? This is a really kind of tough ethical question. I know that's been debated in several projects. For example, when USAID did a crowdsourcing effort to clean up data for uh, d small, uh, small loans in um, uh, one of the countries that there was a debate about whether they should be using volunteers here in the US or actually paying the people who were most affected to be collecting the data that affected them, uh, their communities. Any of the panelists want to jump in? Well, I'd like to say, like, there was uh, a point where we were doing this research um, and writing up the paper, and also actually where we were identify whether, trying to identify whether a project is citizen science, because we saw that, especially when we we're talking about community-based monitoring uh, initiatives in um, Africa, um, they, there was, it was so difficult to collect data. So they had to, in the end, uh, pay some small incentives to the volunteers somehow. But that doesn't mean that these projects should be excluded from being a citizen science initiative or an idea. Because otherwise, if you, if you do not provide the small incentive, there is no way that you could collect data. So this was also one of the things that we were discussing coming back and forward, trying to identify what was the incentive. That's the question. So if it's like a um, um, sal salary that is paid, then we don't call it incentive, right? But if it's, um, I don't know, um, a bike to help going from one village to another um, to participate in an activity, that's a different thing. Or like a one-time small incentive to help them generate income activities, that's another thing. So, yeah. Anyone else, Alex? Oh, sorry, sorry. It looks like Linda. Linda's, Linda's trying to say something, but she's muted. Yeah, Linda, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for that. Sorry, Alex, I didn't see you put your hand up. I was just going to say, I think there's a difference between um, initiatives that are driven by the community, okay, where the idea comes from the community, and, and then there's no reason to be paid. You know, there's a real incentive to why you want to do something, because you want to make a change, as opposed to someone coming in and saying, hey, would you help us collect some data? And in Africa, we found we had to pay people. It's simple. It's very small amounts of money, but it's, and the, actually they get very enthusiastic. And for very small amounts of money, you can get a lot of data. So, I know there. I think it really depends on on the project, how it's been set up. Is it top down? Is it bottom up? So I think it's a very complicated question. Linda, can you comment a little bit on that? Um, so you you're paying them an incentive, but are are you still giving the data back to those communities, or do they have the capacity to use the data once it's been collected themselves, or are you helping in any way to facilitate uh, capacity building so that they are able to use the data in the future on their own? Uh, no. So I think in this case, I mean, we had a specific purpose, and we we needed the data for something, and it really was not going to benefit them. So in that sense, they were almost employees in that sense in, 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 in getting the data say in Kenya for us. Um, but I can see a situation if we built the project differently in which the data benefited the communities because sometimes it benefits research and we know that right uh, and other times it benefits the community. I, I think we would design the project quite differently. Uh, I think that's one thing. So I've been involved in another project to do with flooding and again, that was co-created with citizens. We had lots of urban living labs to design an app, and 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 people are willing to take part in such a thing. And there's no there's no discussion about cost or will you pay us for this. There's absolutely no discussion because people realize that that the information can uh, eventually be fed into an early warning system that can help them with well, not prevent floods, unfortunately, but it can at least warn them of, of floods. So I really think it's very context dependent, very project dependent, and how things are set up. I, I would just like to um, second what Linda's saying is that in most cases, the citizen science activities are because people have a passion about fixing something or studying something. So either they're very curious about biodiversity and that's kind of their passion or that there is a challenge around social justice that they want to try to do a citizen science project around. Um, most of the ones that I've been involved with don't pay and, and I'm not sure if that's sort of the, the, the way that, that we should always move ahead. The one I mentioned in Kampala with Queen Street, so we did pay the boat to boat drivers because they're 
they were conducting a business and um, we were asking them to do an additional thing. And we also wanted them to stop their boda boda, you know, the motorcycles and not just take pictures of the HO buy. So um, we felt that the, in that case, it was micro paint, you know, very small mobile money payments, but it was useful so, to get uh, more of the trash heaps uh, documented. So thank you all. I'm afraid, Alex, I'm getting signal from Rihanna that she's got to, she's the boss here. So she's telling us uh, she's got to end it for the next uh, thing that she has to move on to. I'm sorry to the, the remaining questions. We had a lot of great questions today. Um, there's still some in the chat box. So if folks of the panelists would put their emails if they feel comfortable. I know Jean's been doing it in the chat box that the people who had questions can reach directly out to the speakers. Uh, Rihanna is going to be harvesting the links and posting them and sending an email out to everyone who participated with the archive link to the archive video of this event um, and those resources. So, uh, Rihanna, last uh, comment.